we have joining us on stage first is Jeremy Hallett. Hi. Uh, to my immediate left, Mr. Hallett is executive chairman of the Space Industry Association of Australia. He's also chair of the IAC 2025 Local Organizing Committee. Okay, that's why you're busy. And chair of the Performance and Remuneration Committee within that. So, Mr. Hallett, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, to his left is Mr. Jonathan Hung. Mr. Hung is the executive director of Singapore's National Space Office the Office for Space Technology and Industry. Mr. Hunt was formerly the executive chairman of Singapore Space and Technology Limited, Asia Pacific's leading organization focused on developing the space technology industry. The Singapore Office of Space Technology shapes space policies and international partnerships, grows a globally competitive space ecosystem and talent pool, and supports research and development of space capabilities that serve national imperatives. Mr. Hung, thank you also for thank joining you. us this afternoon. And then finally to his left is Mr. Gabriel Swinney. Uh, Mr. Swinney is director of the U.S. Office of Space Commerce's Policy, Advocacy, and International Division. He comes to the Office of Space Commerce from NASA, where he was senior policy advisor in the Office of Technology, Policy and strategy. While at NASA, he served on, he worked on norms, behavior, legal policy, and the international authorization and supervision effort. Mr. Swinney has uh, was one of the creators of the Artemis Accords and has participated in the negotiation of dozens of international space cooperation agreements. So, Gabriel, also thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. So we've we've stepped to the national level uh, with some national experts who are no doubt international law experts as well. Uh, some of the themes I want to talk about, national approaches to uh, advancing national interest in space, of course, in adherence to international norms, and consideration uh, about how balancing international and national regulatory obligations, again, while fostering domestic commercial space activity. So my first question is, for the man in the middle, Mr. Hung, established only in 2013 by the Singapore Economic Development Board with an expanded role in 2020, uh, OS10 was, is growing its space activity and presence. How has Singapore decided to create regulations that encourage the growth of the domestic space sector while also being aware of and incorporating space sustainability practices? With that, you have the floor. No, thank you, uh, Chris, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, so the National Space Office, as you have rightly mentioned, we are somewhat newer. I think we are about a decade or so old. I think we look at it quite holistically. I mean, first and foremost, um, we do want to make sure that we work together with our international partners, uh, comply with international norms, uh, work together to grow a very vibrant ecosystem. And to do so, uh, we have to have various elements, I think, at our foundational core. Um, certainly, we have started to put in place uh, domestic regulations. Um, it's still early days. Uh, it's a consultative approach. Certainly, working together with our international partners, agencies, uh, industry, uh, being pro-business is very important, uh, both domestically and also for everybody else that wants to leverage Singapore to be a landing point um, for Singapore and also for the wider ASEAN, uh, Asia-Pacific market. Um, I think very important for us is uh, sustainability is key, uh, which is also why we do encourage uh, entities to also work together and have sustainability DNA in most of their programs. Now, in, in Singapore, and I guess largely Southeast Asia, a lot of that work is in satellites, small satellites. Uh, there's a lot out there. Uh, we want to make sure that potentially upcoming programs uh, technically can start to have sustainability elements uh, part and parcel of the entire uh, process, you know, making sure that you sustainability get the pro satellites up into space and make sure that you also find ways to bring down and deorbit uh, satellites as well. It's not so straightforward. I do recognize this technically, there's challenges and various other economic considerations, but we want to put it out there. The second piece is making sure that we have um, uh, registration of, of satellites as well. Uh, again, not something that we, we are forcing down the companies or industry players today, uh, uh, still early days, but we want to get them used to this because again, this is something that we see we do want to align as well. So it's a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, we are working towards that and we hope we get there sooner than later. Thank Great. you, Chris. All right. Next, I, I want to turn to Gabriel. As one of the world's leading space actors across government investment, academic activity, and commercial industry, how has the U.S. government built its current regulatory regime? 
and other activities and what similar practices are you hoping are adopted elsewhere? What might be considered some of the missteps that the United States has made in regulating its space sector that you would recommend new actors uh, could avoid or should avoid? So I know that's a little bit of a prickly <laughs> question, but uh, I know that you're also capable of handling it. The floor is yours. <laughs> it's definitely something we live and breathe and think about a lot. So um, thank you for, for inviting me to participate here, and thanks for the whole Secure World Foundation team for pulling this really awesome event together. Um, I think most of you all probably know a little bit about how the U.S. regulatory system works, um, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about that, but I do think it's important to understand the system we have for better or worse so that you can understand not only the things that work but as you hinted um, some of the things that we could do better you know the u.s system is is really a legacy system mm -hmm. this is a system that has developed over a number of years and was largely designed to respond to the space industry community that we saw frankly decades ago right so we have three primary regulators of outer space I am very jealous, we can talk more about this at some point, very jealous of countries that are establishing space agencies and space regulators sort of now and are creating unitary consolidated regulators. We do not have that. We have uh, the Federal Aviation Administration that regulates launch and reentry activities. Um, we have the Federal Communications Commission that regulates radio frequencies uh, in space just as they do on the ground. They have used that authority over radio frequencies since most objects in space need to transmit information for command and control or data. Uh, they have linked uh, other things, let's say, to the licensing for radio frequencies, um, including things like uh, end of life or orbital demise requirements. The FCC has recently transitioned to a five-year rule for end of life, for example, that becomes applicable later this year. Um, so the FCC has really um, really gone pretty far using their authority over radio frequency. And then finally, um, my own office uh, that I'm a part of, the Office of Space Commerce, we regulate systems that can image the Earth. So you will note in there um, that we've pretty well covered launch and reentry, communications as long as they're radio frequency, and Earth imaging. But that is not everything that is happening in outer space, and it's really not everything that people are planning to do on the commercial side in outer space. So, you know, the things that don't fit in there would be um, tourism in outer space, but also manufacturing, on-orbit servicing, ADR. Really a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about this whole conference doesn't have a clear home in the U.S. regulatory system. You know, that said, there are lessons uh, that I think are worth learning or at least building off of from the United States. One is that we've tried really hard not to get ahead of industry. Sometimes that's simply a, a result of the fact that it's difficult to move quickly in government, but it is an intentional thing to not regulate before it's needed. There is often a temptation when companies or other actors come up with new cool ideas. I remember this happened in around 2015 when companies were talking about space resource extraction and utilization, for example. Um, there is a, a knee-jerk reaction sometimes to say, wow, we need some rules on that, like right now. And we try really hard not to do that unless and until you know what those rules should be, until you know what the space resource activities would be or what the problems are you're trying to regulate to control. So I think we've done a decent job of that. We've also gotten better about being fast and about being transparent in terms of how we regulate and why we make certain decisions. There is a lot of progress we could make there, um, but at least in our office, um, we, we've been able to move pretty quickly and at least move towards transparency. In terms of lessons to learn um, more on the negative side, I hinted at one. Ideally, you would not probably split up different parts of space activities into different places. We've made it work, and we typically get to yes, but it does mean there's extra steps in there to make sure you don't have inconsistencies between regulators. If you have you know, regulations on something like debris or safety, you really ha should have those consistent across regulators. And if you only have one regulator, well, that makes it a lot easier. I also think it's really critical that regulators do have the legal authority to regulate as they need to. Right? This is the flip side of my point about not getting ahead of industry. You shouldn't probably regulate until you have to, but you do need to have the authority, the legal authority, to do that when you need to. And right now there's some pieces of legislation pending before Congress that would give us that authority. We don't totally currently have it right now, um, which makes it difficult to respond to changing circumstances. And then finally, um, 
I would say, you know, basic sustainability rules have been something we have only slowly incorporated into our own regulations. And even to date, that sustainability really is limited, as I said, to sort of end of life and orbital demise. Uh, Richard Dalbello, my boss, spoke this morning about the broader concept of sustainability. The, the sustainability means more than just debris or more than just dead satellites. And I think, you know, we could have done better and we need to do better in bringing a much broader holistic vision of sustainability into our regulations. See, I knew we could answer it. Um, next, thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, next for Jeremy, what kind of relationship does SIA uh, have with the Australian with Australian government regulators. So what exactly, what is that relationship? How do you balance the different regulatory needs of your members? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, the Space Injury Association of Australia is uh, an industry association, mm -hmm. as the name gives away. So to be clear, I'm not Australian government. Um, and so I can say what I want. No, no not quite. Uh, but one of our key focuses as an industry association is helping our members, whether they be domestic or international, with the business of doing business in Australia. And so much of that is about dealing with the various regulatory regimes within which to conduct that business. And uh, an obvious one we talk about at a space conference like this is how uh, space launch and returns are regulated. And in Australia, that's done through the Australian Space Agency, who do launch facilities permits, uh, payload permits for satellites being launched all around the world by Australian companies, and also launches within and returns within Australia. Um, also bifurcated, our spectrum regulatory regime is done within uh, the Australia Communications and Media Authority, Authority mm. uh, ACMA. Um, so that's the different set of regulators to deal with. Uh, and, and one that's perhaps less obvious, but is, is important, uh, in Australia for space companies is a lot of our space activity is on the ground taking advantage of our unique and large geography and by building sensors and antennas and infrastructure on the ground and we find ourselves regularly, regularly engaging with the environmental regulator around permits for where things can be constructed and also regulation with respect to respecting First Nations uh, 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 historical heritage in some of the locations where uh, things are looking to be constructed. Uh, so it's quite broad and deep where we operate. Uh, we tend to engage uh, bilaterally with each of these regulators at a general level to keep that relationship up and then on a needs basis depending on what the individual needs of our members are. Uh, and that's pretty easy to balance because we're often going in to advocate for specific issues where we do have uh, to juggle uh, differing needs of members is when there are changes to regulations and different, uh, different parts of our membership have different views on what those changes should be. And, and with that one, we take the approach that w we are the, the peak body for space. Our members pay their membership dues for us to lead in this area. So rather than saying to everyone, what do you think, and we'll craft something, we craft our views based on our expertise amongst our staff, and then that's what we take to membership to solicit, solicit input on. Like, no one always agrees with what's put forward, but we try and balance what be what's best across the whole Australian space ecosystem. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, so I'll remind folks in the audience that, again, we have uh, the Hoover app, which has polls, uh, which uh, a question for you to answer if you so choose. And you can also submit questions over uh, Hoover, which we'll be taking a look at. I've already seen a couple of questions come in that are uh, pretty interesting. Uh, for the second round of questions, I'm going to go back first, uh, starting with Jonathan, talking once more about Singapore. Singapore is a hub of commercial space activity in the region, from international companies who have the region's headquarters to significant actors working on financial investment in space. How does your team see its role in developing and promoting the space industry? And a little bit line to that, uh, what stumbling blocks have you encountered? Given that you are a small but growing team, how do you balance the different goals of that office? Easy question, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. It resonates very well, especially the last part. Mm. Yeah, so I think yeah, the, the Austin office, I think plays a interlocuting role. Um, I mean, Singapore started a little later, I think in the space sector. Uh, there are many pieces of the pie. Today we are about maybe 2,000 or so space professionals, 60 or so companies that are working within our ecosystem. 
Um, not all of them started off as space space companies per se. And honestly speaking, actually, we see the structure of space companies evolving. Many of them are either data companies, aerospace companies. Um, they evolve and they play in space. If they're successful, uh, that's good, and we try to to spur that along. Um, I think we also leverage on a lot of adjacent sectors to build our space economy. Uh, I, I mentioned the aerospace sector. I think for us, is quite a beating heart of our aviation economy. Uh, we also have a good infocoms and media or ICT sector. You have precision engineering that supports all of that uh, and a bit in between. So we have actually a lot of pieces of the pie. Um, the space part, is the core space part, I think, is today Austin's priority in building up. Uh, having them tied to then key thematic areas that we are looking at, uh, let's say in aviation, in maritime, broad-based connectivity, NTN, uh, QKD, and relevant uh, 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 zones that we believe have economic sustainability are things that we are also trying to drive uh, at. And then coupled together with a vibrant, I guess, or at least we try to to, to, to encourage R&T, R&D uh, ecosystem is equally important. The Space Office administers our Space Technology Development Program Fund, or STDP. Uh, it supports uh, companies uh, and research institutes. Uh, to early stage R&D or mature uh, TRL, uh, we do encourage them to, to work with companies to translate their activity uh, as quick as possible. Uh, one thing we don't want to have is too many long gestation R&D programs. Uh, we want them to commercially translate as fast as possible, get them out the door, and then they can be commercially successful. And this is not just for local companies, it's for the international players that also have uh, landed in Singapore. So these are part and parcel, I think, of how we are trying to encourage and grow our our space ecosystem. I guess stumbling blocks is uh, is uh, is all over. These trials are always there, but um, I think one of the key things is being able to fit um, within new, I guess, uh, opportunities that we see up and coming. Uh, the space sector actually evolves pretty quickly. Uh, I have a bigger focus today also on working on structured SMEs and younger companies and get them out also through the door commercially. Uh, that part, I think, is ever-evolving. We do need to work with a myriad of agencies, not just within Singapore, but also with our counterpart uh, partner agencies overseas as well, that we have uh, bilaterals and strong partnerships. Uh, those MOUs and partnerships uh, or stronger bilaterals uh, tend to have longer programs. Uh, we want to constantly evolve that. So think of it as trying to have these bilaterals become uh, startup sandboxes, you know, and we need to try and get that thinking in place. Uh, I think together as government bodies, we all do know there is a structured process and take, things take time. Uh, but that is something we hope can evolve and maybe try and, I won't say match uh, the speed of our commercial sector because I don't think we will get there so soon, <laughs> uh, but at least meet them halfway. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Um, so let's, I wanna actually go back to Jeremy on this. Looking at it from um, maybe the other side, how do you represent uh, industry both to the Australian government but also externally on the international stage how, how do you you know balance that how do you promote both of those both of those aims in those directions and it given the global nature of the space business mm. you know do you feel the industry should focus on national policy and coordination or do you think that they should be looking more uh, broadly and internationally the, the short answer is we do both and um, that domestic engagement on such matters and international engagement on such matters are two of our three priorities within the association. The third being what you alluded to in my intro that we're delivering IAC in Sydney next year, mm -hmm. uh, which is a big pillar in of itself. Uh, domestically, our focus, and this may sound like a familiar complaint from industry, but there's some nuance to it. Currently in Australia, our federal government has no overarching policy with respect to space. and. That maybe sounds great because you can do what you want, but in reality it means no one knows what to do, um, to put it bluntly. Um, it's difficult to give good signals to industry about maybe where they could focus their efforts in support of government priorities, but it also means across the 27 agencies within the Australian federal government that have equities in space, there is no coordination across their activities as well. and so. Almost strangely for an industry association, domestically we advocate to our federal government um, for them not to think of space as a tool of industrial policy, but rather as a tool for them to leverage in support of executing on their priorities of the government and as a way for Australia to build national resilience. Uh, Australia being what it is, it's it, our, our, over 50% of our economy is 
uh, based on the exploitation of nat natural resources, whether it be mining, oil and gas, agriculture, forestry, fisheries. None of those things happen without space capability. And today, all that space capability is consumed by from either foreign governments or foreign providers with, with no Australian uh, supplies uh, that cover the whole set of that value chain. And so we, we think there's a weakness there in terms of our economic security uh, that we advocate for domestically. Uh, having said that, we can't do everything in Australia. And uh, one of our big focuses on the region we're in, in Asia-Pac, uh, along with Jonathan, mm -hmm. is that uh, there are a lot of other countries emerging into the space arena who are trying to pursue similar ambitions in terms of applying space capability for the benefit of their citizens the same way we do in Australia, who also can't do everything themselves. And one of our big focuses on our international engagement, particularly regionally, is how to bring both governments and industry together uh, around mission-centric objectives, uh, which are the to the benefit of all countries in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, both of those things we're after are a tall order, um, but there are like-minded folk everywhere um, we deal with regularly. It's so, so optimistic and ambitious for those outcomes. All right, interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so looking at the time, it looks like we are halfway through the middle panel, so we've made it halfway. Ruth, how are you doing over there? Great. I'm, I'm good. I've got a question for you. Yeah, Rowan. go ahead. I mean, um, I know you've moved within a couple of agencies within the United States. So if you currently at the Office of Space Commerce, obviously focused on American commerce in space. Uh, NASA, a bit more of an R&D. Um, and of course, the State Department. Um, and, and I know that we asked the previous panel if they thought that the international organizations were fit for purpose. And I think um, if we can ask you as Gabriel, <laughs> not as a member of uh, representing your job in, in government, um, there's obviously a discussion right now in the United States, what agency should regulate the new kinds of missions? Um, and and I'm, I'm sure you know, but I'll just remind some in the audience, in the United States, the right, the license, the authorization to be an object um, comes from what I would call the payload agency. In the United States, if you're doing spectrum with your object, you get a spectrum license from the spectrum agency, the FCC, and they also give you the right to be an object. Um, but if you're doing um, remote sensing, you get your authorization from the um, agency that originally wanted to look um, at the US, NOAA, Oceans um, Agency, um, and they also give you the right to be an object. But in the UK, for example, they split that differently. In the UK, um, you get the right to be an object from one particular agency. It happens to be their aviation authority, um, which asks, by the way, do you have spectrum authorization from our spectrum agency? But the right to be an object all comes from one agency. So different countries have divvied it up differently. So I guess what I'm asking is, do you think, well, I think you the U.S. is probably not quite fit for purpose. As you said, it's been around for over 60 years and it's really um, the legacy issues. Um, is there a, a solution? Do you think will the U.S. will find a way to authorize the new kinds of missions in a way that will work productively as opposed to leaving these new industries um, um, waiting? for a license? Uh, I think we have to. Um, the, the urgency is clearly there. Um, you know, this does require Congress to act, I should say. You know, um, there was a recent decision from the US Supreme Court uh, that some of you all may be aware, um, which sounds very wonky, but it's super relevant to this because it, yeah. just to super over summarize, basically says that if regulators in the United States are gonna regulate something, they have to have very clear legal authority to do, to do so that you shouldn't sort of take whatever authorities you have and then like go a step or two beyond those in terms of like using your imagination. So that makes it difficult. It means that Congress really does need to act to solve this problem. So whether that will happen, I'm not good at prognosticating our Congress, um, but we have to do it. And you know, I think that the clearest reason uh, that I like to give when I talk to 
people on on the Hill, staffers or, or members of Congress, is that there are missions we have as a national priority, things that Congress, for example, has told NASA to do and has funded and put a lot of money in, like our commercial LEO development, like our commercial lunar payload services, right? These are government, well, government money at least, going to the private sector to do things that at the same time Congress has not clearly told a regulator that they can say yes to. And, and I like to phrase it in those terms of saying yes, because my sort of, well, I have lots of nightmare scenarios in space. My lawyer nightmare scenario is that we would have to say no to something that should happen and is a good thing to happen because no one has the authority to say yes. That would be a problem. Uh, it would make us uncompetitive. It means that companies would start to move abroad. So, or activities just wouldn't happen. So, um, Will we do it? I certainly hope so. Um, there's other, there's multiple ways to solve the problem. There has been a long-standing debate in the United States about like where you stick these authorities. Do you put them in the Department of Commerce or FAA? The White House um, released a bill last year that has a particular answer to that question, um, with sort of the our office becoming the let's say default and regulator of most things, but the FAA also regulating um, certain types of in-space transportation as well as crewed activities. I don't really have a strong feeling about that. I will say that industry is very complimentary of our office and seems to want us to, to be a, one of the primary, if not the primary regulator. What's more important though than who has it is that someone does. Having the legal ability to regulate sustainability, respond to emerging challenges that we almost certainly are not anticipating right now um, is really critical. We've, we've sort of jury rigged the system we have up until now but at some point um, that will become increasingly difficult, if not impossible. One thing, for example, that I don't quite know an answer to is who would regulate commercial nuclear payloads. For example, if you get a commercial nuclear uh, propulsion system or power system, that would be a tricky one. For example, we've managed to probably come up with some solutions, but you know that kind of thing that's a step or two beyond what we've seen before would really put tension under our system. So you've, you know, you've brought us to uh, uh, an important threshold that w that we should explore, which is space sustainability and, and approaching space sustainability. Um, I want to. There's a very good question from the audience about how, um, how should national regulators, if they do care about space sustainability, should they be l taking a look at what we have in international law, what we have in the Outer Space Treaty, and maybe going beyond that, or they, do they feel a need to go beyond that? The question is, do you think imposing national rules above and beyond what is in the Outer Space Treaty is the correct approach to space sustainability? Look at the Outer Space Treaty, it's, a, it's, it's basic on there, and it doesn't really get us there enough for space sustainability. So. I know that you are promoting, you know, commercial industry and whatnot, but long-term interest is for space sustainability. So, no, I, I I agree. And as an organization, we I think are quite forward-leaning in advocating for clear direction from government with respect to um, how uh, using outer space resources as well um, is regulated. I was your, your members are on board with it. I think so. It, one of the benefits of being new is, and, and in Australia, the reason I was smiling is uh, it's been 20 years and probably 10 prime ministers and we still don't have a terrestrial climate and sustainability policy bedded in Australia. So I, I, I am nervous to think about how we'd ever get our government to do something about space. Um, mm -hmm. But what, the thing that's driven it there in, in Australia on terrestrial sustainability is the, the population and companies uh, valuing corporate social responsibility and social license to operate. And that being done collectively in Australia for that issue has actually flowed across into the way that Australian space companies want to operate as well. Uh, some, some of those regulatory issues I was, I was talking about before with respect to the environment and, and with respect to First Nations heritage actually is folded into that social license to operate in Australia, which companies take very seriously uh, and is an adjunct to the sustainability question. Uh, and we have clear guidance on how to operate within those spheres, less so in others. And so it is very much, uh, I'll probably say it's a, it's a, a academia and space lawyer led uh, effort first, because they can talk the talk and understand the nuance, but industry is coming in right behind that 
because uh, because the reality is, and we're clear out about this in in Australia as an association. To my to my point about uh, Australia's economy being reliant on space capability, uh, that that could disappear quickly um, if we don't look after what we have, uh, and that's a that's a key, key motivator for us. All right, great, uh, Jonathan or Gabriel, if you have responses to that, I invite you. No, uh, I think certainly the intent is clear, and uh, this is an outcome that is, frankly speaking, uh, not very, <laughs> it's quite unavoidable. Uh, but it's certainly something that I think should be taken as a step process. Yeah, I think the, the path to sustainability in space requires a few elements to come together. Um, I mentioned earlier, I mean, technology does need to keep up as well. I know it's, you're basically implementing a, a new effort uh, that um, maybe potentially, I guess, the overall sector is not ready yet to fully uh, deploy sustainably. Right? I think ultimately, if there's a, if you could put a high value to it and it's sustainable from, let's say, an economic point of view, a policy perspective, um, and potentially even spur additional incentives, uh, I, I, no, I don't think there'll be any issue with people jumping on board. So I, I don't actually see this as uh, something that is insurmountable. Uh, it just has to be unpacked and we have to do that in a calibrated manner so that it's a win-win for both the regulators as well as industry and everybody else in between. Right? We spur academics today to think of new ideas to solve this problem precisely because you want to get there. Right? But we just have to have expectations on how and make sure that we don't, again, I fully agree with uh, Gabriel and also with Jeremy, I mean, this, this calibrated approach is important because if you do it too early or you force fit things that, you know, triangle in the square, uh, it can be quite hard. And if uh, companies start to back away, then we take one step forward, two steps back. Yeah. I, I mean, I certainly agree with, it, with everything my colleagues have said. In terms of the role or the relationship between international law and domestic regulation and what, what rules need to be in place, I certainly think you can't just sort of leave it at the Outer Space Treaty. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the Outer Space Treaty is foundational, of course, uh, and it is very much a floor at the very least in terms of what rules there have to be. But I think we all know, we've heard from multiple panels and speakers today, the Outer Space Treaty is not the kind of thing that you can like build into a mission plan with a few exceptions. You know, there's a few sort of bright line rules like don't deploy a nuclear weapon to outer space, which turns out is apparently a thing we have to talk about again. But um, you know, other than that, there's not a lot of clear rules in there. I remember talking with Chris when I very first started doing outer space law, um, and we were talking about the Outer Space Treaty, and I, I concluded that if I were to ever get a, the OST a quote from it uh, in terms of a tattoo, it would be the due regard provision, because I think that was, was 10 years ago and remains now the, you know, the provision that we need to increasingly look at. So, you know, in two ways, yes, I think we need to go beyond the words of the Outer Space Treaty. We need to articulate what it means, how you implement it, what does it mean to give due regard, and how do you do that in terms of sustainability and other things. And then finally, as a, as a government official, I think it's important to remember, too, that nations have other interests, and it's completely legitimate for governments to put in place additional rules um, to the extent necessary to protect equities that maybe just aren't covered in the Outer Space Treaty. One that I think most people tend to agree with is um, heritage protection, for example. There's nothing in the Outer Space Treaty that says you can't sort of go to the moon and drive all over the footprints. But I think most people would prefer that people not do that. So could governments put in place rules to protect heritage in space? Yeah, absolutely. I think they can and they should. So the Outer Space Treaty is a floor, doesn't give a lot of clear guidance. So we do have our work cut out for us, but it also means it's an opportunity for us to think about what do we really want as regulators or as an industry. And then, of course, coordinate across countries, v very much ideally, because if we all came up with different interests and even worse, different rules, that would um, really fragment the market and make it increasingly difficult for companies to work across uh, across across countries. So, you know, these conversations, although we, they are ultimately about domestic regulation, we need to be working in parallel to ensure that there's as much commonality as possible. And, Excellent. And Go ahead. I think, though, there's possibly, because I was speaking from the industry perspective, and in Australia, at least, industry's leaning in hard on this. But I can see a two-speed thing emerging where, as governments... Uh, predominantly represented in this room are considering this, whereas other governments 
uh, just racing as hard as possible to take the high ground in terms of space capability. Um, that I'm sure there will be a temptation, and there already is, to, well, don't, let's not let regulation get in the way of securing our economic future and how to balance those things as well. Uh, and that's nuance that's difficult to absorb on the industry side of things. Uh, and I guess the point of all that is it really does need more, um, from the Australian side, I'll say, then for overt government um, conversation about this uh, and where at least my country stands as it increases perhaps its um, national security space capability with respect to what we're trying to do commercially in industry. All right, so in our last few minutes, I do want to take a brief look at what we had for the Hoover poll. And the question was about, you know, uh, what should happen on the national level? What are the first steps that should happen on the na national level? What's the most important thing? You know, one of the options was, um, you know, creating a broad national space policy. So if you have that space, national space policy, from that you can have regulation, every, you can have missions, you can have, uh, you know, next steps. And if that, if that, that baseline can serve as an anchor, that was what was most voted for by the audience. But second was, you know, establishing a national space a regulatory agency for the purposes of authorization and supervision under Article 6. So is it national space policy or is it the, you know, create your national regulatory agency? Those were what the audience voted for. If you guys were, let's say, advising, uh, you know, a generic emerging space state that maybe didn't have national space policy just yet, didn't have its national regulatory infrastructure just yet, what do you think is the first step or the most important step, or what are you going to put on their radar for things that they definitely need to do? I give, given where we're at in space today, globally, being commercial-led, um, and this is a partly a reflection on the Australian experience, um, we have a regulator for launcher returns. We don't have a national space policy. So that was the order it just happened in. Uh -huh. And uh, it's in, in that sense, it's worked because industry wanted to do stuff and didn't need a policy to do that. And so the regulatory, that regulatory function was needed to enable the ambitions of what industry uh, wanted to achieve. Unfortunately, maybe the order was regulated policy, but they needed to be about 30 seconds apart in time. And we're, here we are many years apart. And now that we have all this activity, there's a problem around coalescing about what's, what's the point um, for, for the nation. Yeah, I kind of, uh, that is something that I've been thinking about a lot. And I think Australia's experience is, is instructive. You know, the United States has national space policies on specific topics like ISAM and CISLUNAR and some others that you can Google. We don't have an overarching space policy that kind of tells all government agencies what to do. And I think that's okay. And maybe it's appropriate. Maybe it's useful. We don't, with the exception of certain times of science and exploration, which are valuable in their own right and for their own existence, the rest of space isn't just done to do things in space. I think you said this, Jeremy, it's done to support human goals. And many of those goals are currently terrestrial, whether it's you know agriculture or mining or uh, quality of life or climate protection or whatever. You do space so that you can achieve other goals and space is a tool. Um, so to that extent, I don't know that you either can or necessarily should have a national space policy because I am concerned that if you had a space policy that over that stood on top of everything that you do as a government and maybe as a private sector, it would be restrictive because it would be locked into whatever choices you made there. And I think really what we should be doing is creating an environment in which the private sector and everyone who's involved in space academia too, and, and, and the whole community, can respond to their human needs and human desires and use the tools that space provides, just like they can use tools that other parts of industry and parts of human experience provide. Um, that's the, it's that environment that I think it's our job, as at least I see as a government employee, it's, it's my job to create that environment, not to tell the private sector, you should care about this part of space.
Jonathan, I'll give you 30 seconds. I think it has to be a ground-up approach. Uh, I, I think this is something that Singapore has experienced. Uh, we, don't, we, we don't have either, uh, at least not today, in a f full structured manner. Uh, if the industry is able to champion it and take it forward, and again, space is a lot, largely a, a much wider ecosystem. For us, a lot of terrestrial applications see a lot of fruit bearing. We're happy to let industry take the lead uh, and again, not over-regulate, study where the gaps are and then approach it in again a very calibrated fashion. Thank you so much. Audience, that's all you get from these experts, but you can uh, certainly approach them in the hallways or afterwards. Uh, please give them a round of applause for my second set of panelists.